Toby and I met in the front. Uh, telling me there were several things I could do with Paula Storm for a thesis and asking me to decide and think them over. One, of course, was sexual isolation. Second was hybrid sterility. And then he went home to Claremont Avenue for lunch and uh, asked me to think it over and what I wanted to do. I actually had in mind a, a short, sweet thesis with uh, Drosophila in Solaris. Uh, and uh, when he came back from lunch, <laughs> he never asked me for my decision. This was, would have been in 59, late in the year, and he, uh, no, this was in much earlier than that, uh, I say 57. Uh, early in 57, he never asked me for my decision, but he simply gave me the flies I needed to do the hybrid sterility work. I, I never uh, recall ever telling him I had decided upon it. Dubchansky had an expansive personality, affectionate with his friends, effusive with all. He loved people and wanted to be loved. He particularly cherished young scientists, graduate students and postdocs. No duty would likely keep him from being available to discuss science with them. I found him one morning in 1961, having just arrived from Spain, seeking to arrange a meeting with him. Come, he said, come right away. Professor Bruce Wallace from Cornell is here today and he will give a seminar this afternoon and I would like you to join us for dinner after that. I was thunderstruck. It would have been extremely difficult to arrange a meeting with a professor in Spain, much less to be able to speak with him right away, being invited to his house for dinner after a seminar. My English was at the time very poor, and conversation at Dobchansky's house went very fast, so that I could not understand what was being said. I entertained myself breaking toothpicks in my pockets in order to keep track of how many Manhattan's people were drinking during the cocktail hour. To this day, I have not told to Bruce Wallace about that, nor about how many Manhattan's he actually ingested, but I remained impressed. At some point, Topchansky asked me what do you think of the seminar? I said, I did not understand anything. He said, well, I hope it was the English. And I said, I hope so. But I knew it was not only the English. In 1970, I was offered a position in the Department of Genetics at the University of California in Davis. At Dobchansky's suggestion, I asked, Bob Allard, the chairman of the department, whether the university would consider offering a position also to Dobchansky. Allard was, of course, elated, and so was the department and the university. Dobchansky did not want the salary for himself, although he wanted the hard money position for his assistant, Mrs. Olga Pawlowski. All what Dobchansky wanted was a lab to continue his work. We moved to Davis in 1971. On December 18, 1975, in the morning, he suffered a heart attack while still at home. He died in my car as I was rushing him to the hospital, to the emergency room where his doctor was waiting. The previous day, he had been working in the lab, as usual. I phoned his daughter, Sophie Ko, from the hospital. She came and asked me to keep the urn with Obchansky's ashes, which I did in my office in a cabinet, until the snows would melt at Mother, at the station of the Carnegie Institution near Yosemite where Dobchansky had done research so many times and where he wanted his ashes to rest together with those of Natasha, his wife.
fond memories of Dolby revolve around field work, especially at Mather. I thought I'd briefly recount a typical day. Dolby always woke first, no later than six, and would light the wood-burning stove. He was the breakfast cook. He would rotate three items, pancakes, French toast, and fried eggs. As you might guess, he was not much of a cook, and these specialties of his were not much better than his infamous Manhattans. He always took great pleasure in awakening his younger, later sleeping co-workers. After breakfast, he made a pilgrimage to his wife's ashes a hundred meters or so behind the cabin. There he would recite in Russian what I always assumed were prayers. I am often asked if Doby was religious in a traditional sense. I can only say that I saw him once kneeling and praying before the icon he had in his apartment. Mornings at Mather were spent reading and writing. By this time, Doby's hernia precluded horseback riding, which had been such a big part of his earlier days at Mather. Occasional day trips to Yosemite Valley or Timberline were allowed, but we always had to return by 5 p.m. to start the fly work. We would prepare the mashed banana baits and take them out to the sites we had chosen. Most of our work in those days was concerned with dispersal behavior of Drosophila, which meant marking them with fluorescent dust, releasing and recapturing. We would collect flies from about 6.30 until 8, and then had to examine the capture, peering through a microscope using flashlights and UV lights to see the marked ones. We would then have an evening snack of bread, cheese, and wine. Discussions in the screen kitchen those evenings would range from science to philosophy to storytelling to just plain gossip, in about that order and dependent upon how fast the jug of wine was empty. Don't be usually retired before we got to the gossip stage. The summer after Doby died, I accompanied Sophie Coe to Mather to take Doby's ashes to the same resting site as his wife's. Sophie had not been there for a long time, and she did not remember where the granite boulder was, and I had to show her. Chuck Taylor and I always joked it was easy to remember, as it had a shape uncannily like Doby's prominent nose. Sophie went by herself to place the ashes. When she came back to the kitchen, we burned the box the ashes had been in, in the wood-burning stove at which Doby had spent so many mornings preparing his special breakfast. His aphorism, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, might very well serve as a fitting epitaph 